Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast, another Zoom edition. I'm Scott Bernstein, your host, uh, along with a very, very special guest, uh, one of the one of the OGs, uh, all-time favorite uh, content producers, and a true rising star in uh, in the in the mob uh, history space. Who's already uh, a certified superstar in the gambling space, but has really been making his bones in the last year, year and a half. Uh, in, in this space is diverse and versatile, and we love him. Jeff Nadu uh, from Barstool, thanks for uh, thanks for coming back on the OG. Always good to speak to you, Scott. You're one of my favorite people, uh, and I appreciate the kind words. You're uh, you're the true OG, though, and, uh, thanks, and I've, I've learned a lot from you. And uh, I always enjoy our talk. So thank you for having me. Yeah. So Jeff, uh, you know, he, he's he was at Barstool. Then he was uh, on his own. Now he's back at Barstool and his podcast, uh, the Sit Down. Uh, is, you know, it's it, he is the resident mobologist at one of the biggest, uh, really one of the biggest media brands in the world, Barstool Sports. And uh, I, I think it, I was excited for him when uh, Portnoy and company decided to, uh, you know, let, in addition to bringing him back for his, his expertise on, on sports gambling, but l- allowing him to stretch his wings and uh, get in, you know, really roll up his sleeves and, and, and get into this world with that type of backing. It's just it's good for everybody when that kind of content can be spread. Uh, and, and Jeff's been a great ambassador. So just excited. To, we, it's been about a year probably since we, uh, at least for the OG, we've done some stuff on with him. But in terms of the OG, it's been about a year. So thanks a lot. I remember, uh, Scott, you you came on the second episode I ever did of the sit down. It was Nicky right. Scarfo. Nicky Scarfo, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was, I believe it was April of 2021. And then you did another episode we did, which... It's funny because that current state of the mafia show I did, I was one of my most watched shows. And, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun ride, and and you know, people like you are really the kind of the, the originators of all this, and it's all kind of levels because it's funny. I spoke to like Scott Deitch recently, and I kind of listed yeah, great like, episode, great episode with the, yeah, the, thanks. The, the, um, about the yeah, we gang. did the the purple gang one, and I kind of talked with him about that. How you know, for a while it was Selwyn Rab and Capisci and. John Davis, and then it was you and Scott Deach. And you know, now it's like you have a couple new folks popping up on YouTube, like myself and and other people. And uh yeah, it's uh you know, there needs to be people here when when the older guys move on or, or do something else. And uh yeah, you're you're kind of the ambassador yourself. So thanks, man. So we're just gonna do uh a kind of a round the horn uh talk and touch on you know current gangland news. Uh, from around the country, uh, we're going to, just like Jeff and I, we pride ourselves in our versatility. Uh, we're not going to stay kind of in one organized crime lane. We're going to try to spread it out. We're going to hit the Italians. We're going to hit some Irish. We're going to hit some African-American. We're going to hit some cartel stuff. So uh, let's just kind of open it up. Uh, we we were talking about, uh, you know, Jeff's from the Philadelphia area. And the first episode that I did on the sit down was about Nikki Scarfo. So let's just you know, start off with uh, it, we're not going to, this, this won't take too much time. Uh, just a little bit of uh, news coming out of the, the Philadelphia LCN, uh, Bruno Scarfo crime family. It's, it's sad to report that, you know, one of the true, we, we talk about up and comers and fast risers, one of the true uh, rising stars in the, in the criminal defense world, uh, Johnny Maringolo, uh, suddenly passed away a couple of weeks ago. He is the son of the legendary Philadelphia uh, criminal defense attorney Joey, uh, Joe Maringolo, who's represented uh, mobsters in the Philadelphia area, as well as other organized crime figures for decades. And and Johnny was representing the alleged or convicted uh, Philadelphia mob uh, figure, uh, Stevie Mazzone. Mazzone's on the verge of getting sentenced for his role in a 2020 racketeering case. And they were supposed to show up for sentencing and Johnny Maringolo, um, I believe, died the night before uh, or within 48 hours of that sentencing hearing. So now that uh, sentencing hearing is going to be in a couple of weeks from now. I think it's December 15th or 16th. And it uh, looks like Stevie's going to be sentenced to, to six years. Um, you know, throw it over to Jeff. Yeah, obviously, it's it's tragic when anyone dies. He was, uh, Johnny Maringolo was only 48 years old. Um, th- there was clearly trust there with that family uh for someone like Mazzone who was older than Johnny Maringolo Stephen Mazzone's is 60 I think close to 60 you trust a younger guy that to be his defense attorney and 
Uh, you know, it's sad when, when you're saying goodbye to a guy like that, 48 years old. Yeah, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of these guys, I, it, being from this area, you know, whether it's New York or Philly, they've all kind of bounced around, right? Marengolo, uh, Eddie Jacobs, uh, Brian McMonagle, all these different guys. I remember years ago, uh, Fortunato Perry, uh, he was a big uh, lawyer around here. He would do the Bobby rappers. And, yeah, yeah, he was Beanie Siegel's uh, uh, attorney yep. for a while. He was actually in, I believe, one of Beanie's music videos. Yes, um, I do remember that. But uh, but yeah, Maringolo, that's a sad story, man. Only, as you said, 48 years old, very young. You know, I remember him. I believe he represented Porky's and Akio at one point. Yeah. So and he, he tried to argue that the NYPD arrested him because he was Italian. And that was uh, kind of an ethnic thing. Uh, I think he also represented Junior uh, Gotti yeah. at one point. Uh, so he's basically, he's not big. Even though his father was based out of Philadelphia, John was based out of New York City, but I believe had either dual uh, bar admittance uh, or had um, I don't know what they call it, where your 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 bar license in New York is recognized in Jersey or, or Pennsylvania um, because of the the proximity. But uh, he was he was based out of New York City, and so he was he wasn't just representing guys like Mazzone; he was representing a lot of big time New York wise guys. Yeah, yeah, it's a super sad story, man. A great attorney, obviously a guy that represented all sorts of different clients. And I, I read when he died, you know, he represented an NY, uh, you know, a, a fire department in New York uh, firefighter who died in one of the the Deutsche Bank fires. So yeah, he he was kind of a well versed attorney. He was in the federal system, the state system, um, and you know, as we know, I mean, Junior faced what five trials. I think Marengolo was on his third or fourth, but. Um, just a very sad story. Uh, I, I, I was pretty surprised in hearing that. And I believe he, you know, as I think, I don't know if you mentioned or not, but I think he represented Joey as well at one point. So, well, I know that Joe, he very well might have, John might have, but we all know Joe Maringolo, um, represented Merlino in some things, uh, in the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll move on in a second. Just the last thing I'll say is, you know, Mazone 60 years old. He's been to federal prison before. There's no, I don't think there's any worry about him flipping. I mean, he's as solid as they come. Uh, Incredibly popular and well-liked, you know, beloved. All due respect to Joey, I I would say that Stevie is probably more universally beloved. Uh, Joey's polarizing. You either love Joey or you can't stand Joey. I've never heard anyone, at least in terms of guys on the street, I've never heard anyone say anything negative about about Stevie. He's got to do about six years. He'll be out when he's about 66. Could be worse, but at the same time, I'm sure after losing 10 years, you know, lost, I think, 40 to 50 or close to around that, uh, you know, in terms of your your uh, middle ages. And, and now he's, you know, he's six years old. I'm sure you don't want to do, to do six years, but. Yeah, you figure, I mean, you figure in his last 30 years, he's going to do 16 years yeah, 16 years in jail. And that's over half the time. People have to realize, I mean, these people do have families at the end of the day and they don't ask for any of this stuff. They're not in this life. Um, you know, he has two daughters, you know, they're they're both um, you know, in their own lives and and they want their father around. Um, it's a shame. You know, I, I think I think the common thought in, in Philadelphia and a lot of these other areas is, you know, you, you see people like Mazone, who look, I don't think we're not your sugar or anything. He's a gangster. We all know that. He's a, a convicted felon, but you know, to, to serve six years in federal prison while, you know, other areas of the city are being completely pillaged by the drug trade. And it's like, well, what are we still doing here? You know? Yeah. Um, and, but, and it's, you know, we'll get more into this, the more yeah. subjects we hit on, because I think this will be a common theme, but it's like, you know, the government sometimes can, you know, it, it, not everything's black and white. There's a lot of gray. And I think with Stevie, you have, and, and the same can be said, I think, with Joey and some other people in that inner circle. Um, the government wants to punish them and jam them up for things they're not being convicted of now, yeah. but for things that in their mind, they should have been either convicted of in the past or should be convicted of in the future. Um, when you also look, Scott, at, at like the current state of, let's just say, gambling, right? I mean, five years ago, gambling was not legal in Pennsylvania. Right. and you know, I don't think the state or federal government was going to come down as hard on people. But if you have bookmaking in your case, um, they may make more an example because now you're stealing now from the state or from the federal level. And I liken it to you, you mentioned cartels. We're going to talk about cartels at some point. There are there are certain cartels in Mexico that 
uh, commit field theft. A lot of people don't know what field theft is. They're basically stealing fuel from the government, right? Um, that's one of the ways the cartels make money. They're, they're stealing gallons and gallons of fuel. And people liken the Mexican government as to why they go after them so hard for that, but they can move tons and tons of drugs in and out of Mexico. And that's, nobody cares about that. Once you fuck with the government's money, um, you know, they're, they're going to stake more of a, a foothold on it uh, as opposed to drugs. Nobody cares about drugs because the government really doesn't affect them. And with, the last thing I'll say, with Stevie, there wasn't a ton of evidence, right. uh, physical evidence, uh, to actually convict him on this. What they had was was a tape or several tapes. And yeah. you know, tapes don't lie. Yeah. And he's saying yeah. some incriminating things on the tape. But he's, he's speaking as talking about an organization. It's not illegal to be a part of uh, – people maybe not understand – might not understand this. It's not illegal to be a part of the mafia. No. Um, it's illegal to do things in furtherance of, of that membership. Sure. So they have, you know, they have Stevie on a tape uh, at an at a induction ceremony talking to uh, just recently inducted soldiers and kind of giving them a, a pep talk, if you will. Uh, but yes, he's talking about being a gangster, but they don't have any evidence of him taking tribute. They have people three, four people removed from him claiming that he saw a tribute. So I think he just, I think there was a possibility. Yeah, I, my point is like he, he took this plea. He didn't go to trial with this. It wasn't like his racketeering case in, in 2000 uh, where he went to trial and there was a whole four month trial and he was convicted of it. Um, in this situation, he just kind of threw up his hands um, and said, you know, I'll, I'll fall on the sword and do the six years. I, I mean, but without violent crime and with, with major drug trafficking charges, I mean, six years is a, that's a steep beef. No, for, that's what I'm saying. And they're, they're jamming him. him for things they think they should have jammed him for 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I think it's no secret. I mean, and we saw it with, with guys like John Gotti. I mean, the, the, the feds have a, a an issue with certain people. They can't pen them, pen them on anything else. And you know, they're going to hit them hard with with some of this nonsense that, that yeah. no one really cares about in the end. I mean, it, it's it's just how it goes. You know, you got to kind of move I'll, on. Last thing I'll say about Stevie is it, going back to the tape. I, I think it it offends the prosecutors and the FBI agents when they hear the tape where, where Stevie, if people don't know about the tape, where he's like Jeff said five minutes ago, he he's unabashed and say, I'm a gangster. He says it on the tape. We're gangsters. This is what we do. We're not going to let any suckers take, take away from us because we've earned it. And whether or not, I mean, that's for, for a federal prosecutor or for an FBI agent that to them is like a, is like a middle finger. I and, think the problem with Stevie as well is that, you know, you look at someone, for instance, like Philip Narducci, right? Philip has made, inroads in creating a, a business for himself going out and working every day yeah. um you have some of the guys that do that um you know I, as far as i know i don't know of any legitimate employment that some i think of stevie folks, claims yeah. on his on his tax return that he's a trainer at a gym i think he spends some time there i mean he's very but very coupling that guy. with what you said about like i'm this i'm that it, it's yeah you know some are making the, the effort i think maybe they look at him and saying he obviously doesn't care and he's just that's just who he thinks he is so so uh, and then we'll, let's talk about one more death uh, in your neck of the woods, uh, lesser known gangster, but has some interesting uh, ties. Uh, guys, guy's name was Sam uh, Siligato. They called him the Gator um, out of the Ham Hamilton, New Jersey, blueberry capital of the world. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Jeff in a second to kind of maybe give us an insider's view. I've heard a lot of people uh, say that, you know, there's Philadelphia, there's New Jersey, and then there's Hamilton, that it's kind of its own little world in, in itself uh a lot of immigrants migrants uh, that work the blueberry fields uh Siligato was the right hand man to the reputed godfather of hamilton throughout the 60s and 70s and early 80s a guy named vincent jimmy the brute di natale who happens to have a granddaughter that is very prominent in the political sphere uh, in the last five years, she's a Kellyanne Conway. She, uh, powerhouse Republican 
political strategist. She ran the Trump campaign in, in 2016, got him into the White House. Uh, and this was her, her grandfather. She was only 16 years old when Jimmy the Brute passed away of uh, natural causes in 1983. And, and Jimmy the Brute, by the way, even though you talk to anybody, they'll tell you this guy was a stone cold gangster, didn't actually have much of a criminal record. Um, and Sam Silagato was his, uh, his, his right-hand man, his driver. Uh, and, and he just recently passed away. He was 70 some years old, I think. And um, it, did, it didn't really get reported. Uh, I've talked to some people and they basically just said, well, he didn't get reported because he wasn't a big enough deal to have it reported. Uh, and I probably wouldn't even be mentioning it if there wasn't a connection to, to Jimmy the Brute and, and then via Trump or from, from Jimmy the Brute, you can get right. to Trump. Uh, so, it, you know, last thing I'll say to it, I'll say to it before I just throw it to you for some comments, you know, Silgato might've been quote unquote minor league, uh, compared to some of these other guys we've talked about and we will talk about today, but you know, the FBI ties him to at least three murders and they, and they, they, they got a search warrant in the, uh, eighties at some point after Di Natale died and they searched his house and uh, another uh, restaurant that he owned. Uh, they, dug the, they dug those places up looking for bodies. So, you know, he, he wasn't, uh, he, he was more of a serious individual, I think, according to the FBI, than maybe some people give him credit for as just maybe a, a lackey. I think all these people though, that we call associates, these guys that have Italian last names or maybe don't, but they're associates, they're business owners. Um, they all are spokes in the wheel of, that turns that's the mafia, right? So you look into someone like Sam Siligato. I mean, he once was an alibi witness, I believe, for Nikki Scarfo. Um, yeah. You mentioned Di Natale. He, I think, looked at Di Natale kind of as like a father figure, kind of a mentor. Um, and, you know, all of these guys, I, I do also believe that at one point I read that Siligato was, was a big time bookmaker for like migrant workers in that area, yeah. right? And I think in the 80s, someone wrote about that in the paper. And they actually looked into several properties that he had where they believe bodies were buried. Yeah. Um, you know, he's just one of those kind of like old tale, like legend type of people that, you know, I, I kind of liken it. I, I did a piece recently on tough Tony Federici, right? Now, the Rest government will tell you that tough Tony was yeah. a concierge yeah, yeah. and all this high level stuff. But if you actually look into Tony Federici, there is very little actual proof that he was ever in the mafia. He was never really arrested for anything mafia related. Um, did he maybe occasionally hang out with people? Yeah. But I think sometimes we use Italian individuals that are older that look a certain way and we think, oh, they're a mob associate. Now, this guy, I think, probably made a lot of money for the mob. We just don't really hear about him much because, you know, he was just kind of a little bit more enclosed. Nobody really knew much about him. But if you know him, you know that he had a lot of businesses and I'm sure a lot of it was. Uh, cutting up. I mean, he was involved with gambling, prostitution. I'm sure he, you know, had some bodies. I mean, that's just that's the well, one of the bodies that they they connect to him. The Fed, the federal government, they never charged him with it. But uh, some informants told uh, their handlers in the FBI that there was a prostitution ring being run out of the this tavern called the Silly Gator Inn, yep. which was where Jimmy the Brute would headquarter out of and spent most of his days and nights. And uh, was Siligato's girlfriend and uh, this Hispanic prostitute that was doubling as a side piece for Siligato got pregnant. This is according to the informant, uh, told Siligato and Siligato and Jimmy the Brute killed her to end the pregnancy and, and end her uh, and buried her underneath the, the, the bar. They never found her, never got charged. Um, but both, of all, I think all three of the murders that they tie Siligato to they tied to Di Natale too as well. Um, so you know, I know Di Natale that was a pretty was a pretty big deal, even though uh, you know, in the in the Philadelphia mob lore, he might get lost a little bit, but you, you look, you talk to FBI agents, you look at their you know surveillance logs and their records, he was taking audience with Phil Testa, Angelo Bruno, Nikki Scarfo. Uh he, you know, he he was a, he was a, a major player that just happened. I kind of I kind of like in Hamilton to like Chester in a way, Chester, Pennsylvania. Chester had a very big and large uh, mafia faction, right? In, in the seventies, the eighties, 
um, all these little towns. And we know Hamilton well from the, the Ron Previty era where, right. you know, and I remember when I looked at Iran, you know, Hamilton is a huge Sicilian population. You mentioned it's the, the blueberry capital, but um, they're all from the same area in Sicily. And um, yeah, this guy, I'm Jimmy, the, if you, if you ever look or uh, you look at him, I mean, he's a central casting mob guy, yeah. you know, Scar and Scarfo, uh, Scarfo had some personal, I mean, it did, I, I, sh I should know this. I wrote the, the yeah. autobiography of his of his his nephew. So I shouldn't be asking this. I should, I should be saying this. Uh, you know, Scarfo spent some time working in those blueberry fields yeah. uh, as, as a young as a young man. Um, you know, we'll move on. But I, I just one thing I I learned about uh, when I, I did a little research on him and talked to some people and read what had been written when I found out that he had passed. And one of the things I find most interesting about uh, from a business perspective, him, Siligato, and, and, and Jimmy the Brute. According to some, some people, I don't think there's any official record of this, but they were the first people in the state of New Jersey to have a video game arcade um, at some point in the 70s before video games were everywhere or even available to in the 80s, I mean, I have a recollection, I'm a little older than Jeff. I mean, I can remember as a young kid, there were places that you went and you just played video games. I mean, it was before everybody had home consoles. Um, but this was even before that. I mean, this was before anybody really even knew about video games. I, I was told by people that Siligato and Di Natale had some in somewhere. And they it was the state of the art location for kids that we're just blown away by the ability to play, you know, space invaders or whatever. Well, I remember, I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, you know, you'd go down to the shore, you know, on the boardwalk. I mean, there were those arcade kind of places everywhere. Right. Um, but you're talking about, you know, even 20 I years. I'm talking about like the big video yeah. arcade games. Yeah. Um, the, the, the computerized stuff that in the sixties did not exist. And in the seventies were just starting to come into existence. Well, those things fell off trucks. And then the right, exactly. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on and um, let's let's talk about some. I some was always stuff. fascinated by Kellyanne Conway and her not ever wanting to talk about her father. And it's like, I and mean, then Nancy Pelosi. We're talking about you know political. Yeah, she's uh, another one. Nancy Pelosi had a father that uh, and a grandfather that were were allegedly tied into the Baltimore uh, uh, mafia, which was a sub faction of the Gambino crime family. So uh, and you know about you know, Trump's uh, connections to certain right. people. That's that's no secret. Uh, and Trump admits it. Uh, you know, in terms of hey, I I was working <sighs> in constru said. construction in the 1980s, and if you were working in New York in construction in the 1980s, you had you were inevitably were going. It's funny he never talks about how when he fleeced Salvi Testa for that yeah. piece of uh, property on property. Uh, Pacific Avenue, I think it was. Um, let's move into some cartel stuff. Uh, very interesting news that's been breaking over the last couple of days. Jeff's been on top of it. Uh, La Barbie, uh, for right. people that might not know, an American-born Mexican cartel boss enforcer uh, that really ran roughshod uh, through certain certain uh, spaces within the the big, big, big time international global narcotic uh, trafficking world. Um, was a Texas football star in high school, ends up marrying the daughter of a cartel boss, learns to speak fluent Spanish, or has some Spanish heritage, knows how to speak the language, and uh, rises really fast and uh, eventually gets arrested in 2010. He's disappeared from, uh, from, from the federal prison system. Which people are take or or, or uh, <laughs> people are interpreting that as that he is now in the witness protection program. I, I mean, there there's no other there's no other reason. I mean, you don't just they don't just decide, hey, you're doing 49 years for uh, you know selling little tons of cocaine and 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 all sorts of things. After we fought to get you extradited here, we don't just release you after what four years. Mm -hmm. uh, he's cooperated, surely. And I think a lot of people look, the truth of the matter is La Barbie is a fascinating person. He is a guy that is the only known American that I'm aware of that 
literally left a, and, and people have to understand, this is not some kid who grew up in projects and had nothing. His yeah. family were, were, were well off. They, yeah. his, his sister's a prosecutor for the federal government. They were a good people. They were a big family. Uh, he played football, as you said. He literally, Scott, went toe to toe with Los Zetas. He literally right. was the armed wing of the Beltran yes. Leva cartel and went toe to toe. I mean, you and I talk, this is a guy that's probably responsible for killing hundreds of individuals. He is if not, yeah, if not more. And, you know, when you reach the level of violence at, at the cartel, um, at that level, that, that, that it's, it dwarfs anything that the mafia or African-American drug lords have even, <laughs> have even thought of doing when you're talking, of, you're talking about where, where life is so worthless and cheap. And, and if you're a boss, you, you could be responsible for, I mean, a thousand, thousands. I mean, El Chapo is responsible for thousands of murders. Well, and it's interesting too, Scott, because the, the individual we're talking about, he actually went toe to toe with arguably the most dangerous person in the history of this world in Miguel Trevino Morales, who, if you know anything about the Los Zetas, he was incredibly depraved. I mean, a guy that probably killed 5,000 people. I don't think that's, 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 that's probably conservative. Um, but he also, La Barbie, he was famous for uh, creating the execution video that we yeah, know so we, now Jeff, that's very normal. Jeff and I were, yeah, Jeff and I were talking off uh, air about how he was rolling these videos out in the late, uh, mid to late 2000s. 2005. It, yeah, he's trying to be a, a social media gangster before people really even understood what social media was. Well, and, and now it's that is commonplace. Right. You know, every cartel uses that. And and now it's, you know, you see every other day there's a there's a beheading video on 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 somewhere. But yeah, he made that famous. And yeah, now he's just disappeared. And I think it's clear, you know, the DA will tell you that he's been collaborating for for years. And I think from what I understand, he's likely probably going to cooperate against uh, political figures, you know, yeah. corrupt people in the Mexican government and Mexico, yeah. has, it's funny because it's a big story in Mexico. Nobody knows where he is. They're blown away. They don't, they don't understand this. And it's like, yeah, he's cooperating. He has, and he has direct links to, to El Chapo. Uh, oh, yeah. He acted as, a, I think, a driver and a bodyguard for, for El Chapo. remember, Scott, he was, La Barbie was with Beltran Leyva, which at one point were aligned. If you know anything about Chapo, right. Chapo grew up around the Beltran Leyva brothers. They were once very close. And then. Chapo believed, or they believe Chapo cooperated on one of their brothers, right. and then the war started. So yeah, they he this guy had a ton of power, and the reason he he had a trouble is down the road he tried to take over the Beltran Leva organization, and then the cops centered in on him, and that was that. But yeah, he is a very plugged in person. I know you mentioned I'm blown away we haven't seen a film about this person yet. Yeah, um, and and I'm sure this isn't the last. I haven't even heard, I haven't even heard. I mean, there's a lot of stories that have never made it to the big screen, but you hear about projects being in development and they get derailed for one reason or the other. And I keep track of it, you know, because I have a part of my career uh, in that entertainment world. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. I, I mean, not to say that that's not to say that it doesn't exist, but there's not there's there's not been any reporting in the Hollywood press that there's anybody trying to develop a story well, from what i heard and, and i don't know if you've heard this but from what i understand army hammer bought uh the rights to this story at one point okay well, i don't okay, know if, I, stand, I stand corrected yeah i don't know if i don't know if it ever you know army hammer has his own problems he has his own issues right now it's a but, good uh, documentary check it out if you like true crime docs uh house of hammer i watched it it's it's good if you love you love crime docs and you love history because his family uh want to talk about touching a million different global powerful figures mm -hmm. uh his, you know his his grandfather was a was just a, a mogul's mogul i mean just this huge yep. and i always thought i don't I digress for a second i always thought that our, our the, the army hammer family were the arm and hammer baking soda people but they weren't they're they were oil people yeah i mean that's i never thought about that um <laughs> it could probably kind of make assumed. sense i just um, assumed but he's a complex dude, um, and I, I I believe he has this story. But um, you know how that kind of moves. I don't think, getting, I don't think Army Hammer is getting anything made any any no, time. No, no. The last thing I'll say about La Barbie, uh, and I don't have any question in my mind that he's in he's in protective custody. 
it with the federal government and some type of witness protection that he was told for what you did for us and what you will do for us, um, you know, you're not going to have to really serve anywhere near uh, the sentence. I mean, Scott, uh, let me ask you something. Victim. Don't you think it? Don't you think it's amazing when you think about it? I wrote a blog about this today about how the government is just kind of willing and saying, "Hey, um, we hate you." But we hate someone way more than you. Yeah. So we're willing to forgive the fact that you did all this stuff. You probably have killed hundreds of people. And we're yeah. now going to say, you know, what? we're we're good with it. Just cooperate. And we're going to throw you in Lincoln, Nebraska somewhere and give you a nice house and a, and a dog and a car. And you imagine walking out of your house and you meet this guy and this is your, I mean, think if you're me and this guy moves next door to me. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, La Barbie, the, I mean, the guy literally killed hundreds of people. Yeah. And we're just going to forgive it. You man. make fun. You know, they're okay. You know, federal government at the end of the day is okay making a deal with the devil if, in their mind, that deal with the devil gets them a bigger, a more dangerous devil. Right. John Gleason told me that. I said, How did you justify Sammy Gravano's deal? And he said, Well, you know, we put it all together and realized that the cooperation he gave us would have put a lot more people that were worse than him together in jail. And, and Sammy I physically guess, killed a lot more people than John Gotti. Yeah, yeah. I guess essentially, it's 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 fascinating though, really. But Bar- so Bart, we know that La Barbie, or we shouldn't say we know. There are federal documents that show, and if you believe those federal documents, uh, that back in uh, the late two thousands, before he was taken into custody, that he had provided information to FBI, DEA, and ATF. Um, in relation to where his mentor uh, Arturo uh, Beltran Leva's uh, Leva was in hiding, and then subsequently there was a a, a shootout, and uh, four people ended up dead, including Arturo and I think mm-hmm. three of his bodyguards. And there's some documentation in court files that send the or that he probably that should have been out been out sooner. If Beltran yeah. Leva doesn't die, he probably goes and testifies against him, and right. that's that. The, the problem that, um, listen, he's cooperated, okay? They don't make clerical errors. And if he died, right. it would say deceased. He yes. didn't die. He is a rat, and he is somewhere in protective custody now. And, you know, he'll be living in America somewhere in the you next know, year. Uh, let's, let's keep it on the international tip. Uh, the biggest drug kingpin uh, of modern era from, from the Dominican Republic, uh, Cesar the Abuser Peralta. The man that allegedly tried to kill Major League Baseball Hall of Famer David Dick Papi Ortiz uh, recently was convicted in a major drug trafficking case out of Puerto Rico and Miami and will be doing at least 10 years in federal prison in America. And again, I wouldn't even be bringing this up if, if there wasn't a tie to Big Papi, who's one of the most beloved, even though he's from the Dominican Republic and he's got to be one of the most beloved uh, athletes in American sports uh, in Boston. I mean, he, it's like big poppy, Tom Brady, Larry Bird, and Ted Williams. I mean, they, they, he's, he's a guy, he's a godlike figure in, in, in Boston. And at first it was dismissed. Uh, I think the, the Boston press didn't really want to admit some, there were some other media outlets that didn't want to go as far as claiming that, the, that when, when uh, David Ortiz was shot, three years ago uh, in a bar in the Dominican Republic that it was a case of mistaken identity or, and then it eventually comes out that no, that it was a hit. It was a murder contract that Peralta had put on his head um, over a, a, a love triangle of some sort, uh, a woman that Peralta felt like belonged to him and Big Poppy was romancing, uh, buying her Jaguars and, mink coats and taking her on trips around the world and Peralta tried to kill him. Peralta had been on the run for a while. They finally, they got him in, uh, the, uh, the, I think it might have, they might have arrested him in Colombia and now they've extradited him back to the United States and he, he's going to be doing 10 years in federal prison. You know, I'm always, um, I was always fascinated by this, this case with Big Poppy because you know, it was obviously, you know, the women are always seemingly at the center of some of this evil stuff that happens. But I was always blown away that the, the guy did it himself. Like that's uh, especially with how big of a drug trafficker he is. You can't get like a 
you know, an underling to do? Well, I think, no, I think one of the underlings actually shot. I think he was like there. But to even be there, it's like, what are you right. doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, <laughs> well, Big Poppy, I, I happen to have a, a, a pretty good in uh, with, with the Boston media via some family uh, connections that are very close to, to uh, Big Poppy Ben. You can hit the siren. Um, I, uh, from what I understand, Big Poppy and the, the, Cesar Peralta and Big Poppy were friends. Um, they were, they socialized together. Uh, they were in some ways kind of on equal uh, standing in the DR. Uh, he, Peralta was this like Al Capone, John Gotti like figure that people feared, but also coveted his presence at bars and clubs and restaurants and had a, a lot of ownership in those bars and clubs and restaurants. And, and, and Big Poppy was, you know, the guy could run for president of the DR and win. Uh, so they were kind of in this similar orbit of celebrity in the DR and they, they socialized together. And I, from, from what I've heard, they lived or for at least part of uh, their years, they both had uh, penthouse apartments in the same uh, luxury condo uh, in, in Santo Domingo. So they they were familiar with each other. That must be a very powerful woman in the center of that yeah. to do all that to someone that I mean, I, I it was funny. I was in an Uber a couple of weeks ago. The, the guy was from the Dominican and we were talking about he was telling me that, as you said, like David Ortiz is like a, a king there yeah. like he is the you know the he is michael jordan you know he's yeah. he's the the dead set guy and yeah it's it's you always wonder i have to see this woman she must be some <laughs> knockout and, you, and everything you hear about you never know i mean if we've learned anything over the last 10 15 years you never you, you don't know your heroes i mean right. there's so much that we don't know but from you know from from just from a face value perspective david ortiz seems like one of the good guys. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, he had the kind of the steroid thing hanging over his head for, but but for the most part, he had a pretty blemish-free career. Uh, was was a guy that was a leader in the clubhouse, as clutch as, as any baseball player that I've watched in person. Um, and was Very a guy that too. was everybody. The media loved him. The fans loved him. His teammates loved him. Mm -hmm wasn't one of these superstars that, you know, has a reputation as a prick. Yeah. Very likable. I always liked David Ortiz. I mean, I'm not the biggest Boston guy either, but yeah, it's uh, you know, it, it goes back to with, with the case, as far as the, the, the drug case, I mean, so the guy does 10 years, he gets out. It's not going to stop the flow of drugs coming in yeah. and out of the Dominican Republic for any second. So yeah. What are we really doing here? But uh, yeah, a wild story. Always, always I, found it to be a wild story. When I was reading some of the court documents, you know, the, the DEA is alleging that this Peralta, his his reach in the drug world goes well beyond DR. That in that whole region of the world, that Caribbean region, that uh, you know, he is a he is a drug titan. So we should see what happens. Well, it's uh, kind of that meeting point. Yeah, you, know, you have Asia, yeah. and you all you always had Colombia. You have kind of the DR right in there, and then it's. The trampoline to Mexico and then into the United States. So um, let's talk about a couple guys that could be seeing freedom soon after quite a while behind bars. Let's start with um, we'll, we'll start with the uh, uh, we'll go African American drug world. Um, Washington D.C. You know, probably the most legendary drug world figure in the history of uh, D.C. Uh, Rafael Edmond uh, appears to be close to seeing the light of day it looked like he was going to be serving multiple life sentences but uh he he cooperated back in the 1990s and because of that was able to um get a future outdate or the potential of a future outdate now it appears that that will be coming up in the next couple of years the federal government can um you know, let him out uh, at their discretion. I think the federal judge said uh, he has to serve at least three more years, but could be let out at, at any time if the prosecutor uh, dis decides that they would like to let him out after a year. He come after, could, could, could come out after a year, but at the very latest um, would be like 2025. And uh, Edmund, so it was kind of a short reign, 
but it was the legacy is is quite long lasting and uh a lot of bodies um he was a lot of cross sections with 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 uh with with sports uh, maybe not professional sports but with uh, college athletes at that time Georgetown uh men's basketball was was one of the top programs in the country. It was a perennial top five team. And uh, he was spending a lot of time with, with the Georgetown Hoyas, uh, particularly Alonzo Mourning, who would go on to be a NBA all-star. And uh, there was a famous meeting with, with John Thompson, the, the legendary basketball coach from Georgetown, who, who called him into a meeting. And uh, just they, they sat for about an hour. Yelled at him the meeting. whole time. Yeah. And uh, Edmund almost awarded as a as a badge of honor because he loved the Hoya so much. I don't believe he ever went to another game after that. I think he uh, kind of disrespected Thompson, just stayed away. Yeah. So, uh, I, what I find interesting, and I want to get your take on this, sometimes you can be such a folk hero on the street that cooperating doesn't really affect the way you're looked at to some to some degree not it not a hundred percent well i think but, nowadays you're a hundred percent right I, but i think with the old school street guys that's not going to change for them that no, you're yes. not to them but yeah nowadays i mean i mean i think it's pretty clear nobody cares anymore uh the same ethics i don't think are out there and i've i've heard about ray fledman i know frank fiordolino told me frank fiordolino jed with him at one point uh, and he said he was a, a, a very nice guy. I think, you know, Rafe Webman, whether he's a rat or not, I think he's kind of one of those real old school black drug dealers that still, he he respects someone like John Thompson. These new age guys, they would probably try to kill him. Yeah, they would. Rafe Webman was just like, you know what? I respect you. I'm going to stay away. You're right. I shouldn't be around young kids like that because I'm going one way and they're going another. You well, know you know what I, he was doing? If if people, I mean, this is the reference point that I have, and maybe I'm dating myself, but if you remember the 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 movie Above the Rim with Tupac, right? Uh, you know the way that they kind of explain or show this summer basketball world in certain big cities where drug dealers will field teams, and there'll be a lot of money on the line uh, in these. Uh, park uh, these games that happen in in uh, you know open air parks and and uh whether it be the rucker in, in in new york city or or other places like that and uh edmund was a huge basketball fan and in the years that he was this huge drug lord he made sure that the best players in washington in the washington dc baltimore area virginia area that uh, that they play for him in the summer. And a lot of those Hoyas, including Morning, including another uh, future NBA player named John Turner, uh, were were players on those teams. And like Jeff said, once Thompson, and, and there wasn't much of a run left for Rafael Edmond at that point, but it, it is noteworthy to say that he respected where, where Thompson was coming from. And I think... I don't know if he didn't realize or didn't care until Thompson brought it up that like, this is more than just you, man, you're bringing heat on me, on my program, on these kids. Uh, and I think there was a, there was like this come to Jesus moment. with well, him. Was, where, I think it was back when the drug trade had ethics. Yeah. You know, I always liken it to the wire. Marlo Stanfield had something that Avon Barstow never had. He had that depraved, you know, evil being where he didn't care about anything. It was about what he wanted. And that was that people like Ray Fledman didn't think that way. They, you know, if there was a killer on the street, they were going to get rid of him. So it didn't fuck with their business. You know, I don't want them around kids like that. You know, and it's funny because I think Ray Fledman at one point, one of the reasons he cooperated was because he caught cases in jail where he was yeah. still conducting business in jail. And Eric yeah. Holder, I believe at one point, um, kind of uh, bemoaned the BOP for allowing it to happen. Yes. I think a lot and of it led to the fact of why we see places like the Supermax now where you can't do shit like that. Because uh, if you remember, like with Rayful, uh, Kabani Savage did all of his dirt 
in the federal prison system. Mm -hmm. He ordered that firebombing in the yep. feds. That was a bad thing for the feds to allow that to happen. So, and uh, you know, having the final word on this, I'll just say that all these guys, whatever their past glories were, or they all have to watch their back for the rest of their lives. I mean, just look no further than Alpo Martinez. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone just like Rayful had that legendary street status in, in Harlem. And uh, there was a movie made about him and uh, got out, cooperated, got out, finally you know, got out from a life sentence and, you know, was out for five years, six years and got killed in Harlem uh, last, you know, in 2020, either 20. Well, I think Rayful, he's smart enough to kind of stay away. I, I would love this. You know, I'm sure we'll see it. I, I would love to see an interview with him at some point. Yes. I, I, you know, he is. Uh, you know, I think he's like late fifties, probably at this point. Um, yeah, it'd yes. be really interesting. Um, Vito Guzzo, uh, Colombo crime family soldier, is kind of on the verge of, of seeing freedom, or possibly on the verge of seeing freedom. Ain't gonna happen. I don't. Uh, trying to get a compassionate release. Uh, you know, he's significant for the fact that he was one of the the shooters. You know, one of the frontline soldiers in that Colombo, uh, the last Colombo war of the 1990s, where uh, Junior Persico had to uh, hold off uh, uh, insurgents from his acting boss, little Vic Arena, who's also been desperately trying to, to finagle his way out of a life sentence. It, the, the reason I find it interesting is and this, you know, there's a through line here. There are guys that were involved in that war that uh, killed quite a few people um, that are that are out and free and uh, you know living living their lives. And, and maybe those were, you know, what what's, I guess what you know what what who judges who's responsible for what in, in regards to when an order gets sent down and why are, why does the federal government want to hold certain people more accountable than others? Well, it's an easy answer for, you know, in some, in some regards, it goes back to what you said, what Gleason told you is that if, if you can give them someone they want, then. I, I think the problem that Vito Guzzo has is he, he didn't, he, he was killing people for his own want. Okay. And you look at, for instance, he killed, an individual that he believed killed his father. He shot at a moving car with three made men in it and one died. Uh, he also killed two drug dealers and lit their bodies on fire. He's a, a depraved human being. He admitted to five murders at 38 years. The problem that he's going to have in his, you know, he's saying that he's just a regular guy. He's moved on from his life. How does that explain as to why you got made in prison? You also committed a, a prison riot in Danbury several years ago. And he's also not really denounced anything. He hasn't denounced that he's not in the mafia anymore. He's not yeah. part of that life anymore. I, th I think he didn't necessarily, I think a lot of his murders take, you know, take an order. He just did it. You know, he was uh, just, he's a lunatic. He was shot twice, survived. Uh, he's definitely developed a reputation. A lot of people called him the, the next John Gotti at one point due to the fact that he was from Queens and he, you know, just seemed to be kind of immortal, if you will. Uh, he kept, people kept trying to kill him and he survived. He was part of the Giannini crew, which, you know, you know, Frank was a part of and, and Paul Raguse and all those guys. Um, Vito was a, he's a dangerous dude, man. Probably one of the more dangerous people that is coming up from the younger kind of group of, of gang mobsters. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, by no means am I saying that he's for sure going to, to get a get a, a, a get out of jail uh there's at least i agree with you i'll say it. no, it's not gonna happen okay it, he, but no way the bigger i think the the bigger overall arc that i want to touch yeah. on though yeah. from that is since 2020 and the onset of the covid pandemic and we might have talked about we might have talked talked about this in the past in some of our past you know content that we've, we've made together but it's turned into a giant get out of jail free card for a lot of organized crime figures that would have never even been able to think about getting out, but because of overcrowding, because of age, because of medical conditions and whatnot, a lot of these guys are 
are getting a, a, a second chance at freedom. I agree. Unless this is probably a bad example of someone that could use it to his benefit. I think but, it depends. Look, if your last name's Gotti, you're not getting out. Uh, if your name is uh, Tommy Schatz, you look at what some of the things he was involved with. A cop died on his watch. Yeah. Probably not going to get out. Um, you know, Peter Gotti, talk about him. Gusso, again, this is a guy that killed five people. He admitted to it. Okay. He should have got life. The government said, you know what? We won't go to trial. We'll just give you 40 years. Yeah. Um, I don't see it. Um, we've seen sentence reductions, maybe, I, but he's not going to get sprung or anything. What I, I, what I go immediately go to in my mind, and, and some of this might be apples and oranges, but in other ways, it's not because it's, it's the, we're talking about the First Step Act and yeah. uh, sentence reduction, which is really, you know, for, for my dollar, I, I can't really say much positive, many positive things about Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, one thing that I think he did uh, that was very important that, in my opinion, is probably the only lasting positive legacy that this man might have uh, is that he championed the First Step Act, which needed to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, drug dealers serving life sentences for, uh, you know, essentially nonviolent crimes, you know, should not be clogging up the prison system the way that they are. And he's given a lot of people an opportunity uh, and combine that with the, with the pandemic. The one thing I'll say though about guys that I would have never expected to, to be able to get out that have gotten out, and that was the kind of apples and oranges thing, was there's been a lot of gangster disciples, um, an African American game based out of Chicago that has spread, you know, all over you know, East Coast and, and Midwest and down South. Uh, Larry Hoover, you know, the one of the most infamous African American crime lords of all time. Uh, in Supermax, and it's crazy to think that the government thinks that he's calling shots from Supermax. It seems almost impossible. Uh, but Hoover's not going to get out on it, and he's tried. He ain't going to get out on first step. But there was two or three of Hoover's top lieutenants, uh, guys that were serving life sentences that you would have never thought had a chance to get out, that were, that were able to find their way out. It shouldn't be like what I'm about to say, but it is. It's truly a case case basis. If they like you, maybe you'll get out. You look at like Bobby Manna, Frankie Lacasio. Yeah. Shouldn't have died in prison. But, yeah. you know, you look at Frankie Loke, who is he associated with? John Gotti. Yeah. You look at Bobby Manna. The feds believed he attempted to have Marion Barry killed. Mm -hmm. That's just the truth. It probably didn't happen, but they thought it happened. They're just people that I think develop a reputation that they don't like. And then there are people that that they are like gonna like. I just think with Guzzo, he's again, he didn't get made allegedly until he went to jail. Now, yep. whether the mob approves of that as far as do they recognize it, we don't know. But you know, he hasn't exactly been a choir boy either behind the wall either. So yeah, I think he's probably gonna do his every minute and he'll get out in 2030 or whenever it is, and we'll see how it goes. But he's he's had a lot of bodies on him, so I don't think it'll be easy. I uh, only want to touch on one more thing. We'll wrap up. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, talk a little Whitey Bulger, uh, a little maybe a slice of that Whitey Bulger story that people didn't know. And I've learned more about as I've reported on it. Uh, so Whitey Bulger got killed in 2018. A crazy, powerful, insane, demented, just a hellion. I mean, one of the worst individuals that that has ever walked this earth. Uh, James Whitey Bulger, uh, Irish crime lord out of Boston, was also working with the federal government for 25 years, uh, finally caught a decade ago, roughly after 15 years on the run, convicted of eight, uh, 14 murders, I think 13 or 14 murders, and is in a protective custody wing in Florida, gets transferred, no one really knows why, into a general population wing uh, in, in West Virginia and within hours is beaten to death uh, by, allegedly, by uh, Massachusetts organized crime figures. Uh, the, the ringleader of this hit team, allegedly, was a guy named Freddie G's, uh, who was a, 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 a guy that, uh, very tough, uh, a guy that uh, made his bones in Springfield, Massachusetts, guy that if he had been Italian, 
would be a, a, a made guy, you know, possibly more, but he was Greek, so he couldn't be made, but he was very close to the Genovese crime family leaders in Massachusetts. When he was in state prison in the 1990s, before he went away uh, in 2010 uh, on a murder case where he's gonna be serving life, uh, he was mentored in prison by a guy named Freddie Weichel. Freddie Weichel was a low level member of Whitey Bulger's Winter Hill Gang. And Freddie Weichel was framed by Whitey Bulger. It's been adjudicated and uh, a, a civil court jury recently came back with a $33 million verdict uh, that Freddie Weichel deserved uh, or based on a wrongful prosecution, based on the corruption that, that Whitey Bulger was involved in. And um, they framed him for this 1980 murder. He did 35 years, I believe, in prison. Got out a couple years ago, just got this verdict in the last month or two. But it's it's interesting to tie that into the motive for our, if you believe certain theories and narratives, the motive for, for Freddie Gius being the one to kill Whitey Bulger was exacting vengeance it's, for what Bulger had done for someone that he felt very close to and, and Freddie Weichel. It's a very interesting connection, isn't it? And I will say, man, the money they've had to pay out due to the Bulger yep. and, and really just a corrupt FBI in Boston, whether it was John Connolly or you look at even like Peter Lamoni. Yep. Peter Lamoni did what, 30 years in prison for yep. And how much did they pat in that? That was, 100, that was $100 million. Yeah. I mean, just you know, the, the damage that people, several uh, agents did up there is crazy. But um, yeah, that's an interesting connection. I, I'm, I, I kind of thought about that myself. And, I, you know, I think it was a, a several things. I mean, obviously, if Gias did it, uh, which we don't know if he did, I, I will say, I think that is still one of the more corrupt things the BOP has ever done. Ever. Uh, it very much likens to the, the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. But again, think yeah. of it like this. You and I both know this, and we talked about it during the LaBarbie stuff. They, they don't make clerical errors, okay? They don't put an 88-year-old male who, look, you know this better than me, Scott. Any 80-plus-year-old individual in the feds goes to Danbury, Butner, or, or Springfield, or mm -hmm. Rochester. That's mm -hmm. a federal medical centers. You in no way would ever ship a man in a fucking wheelchair to the one of the worst federal prisons. He's got a target on his back to a federal prison that's known as the worst federal prison outside of, Mountain, yeah. of, of Florence, uh, Supermax, who happens to have a uh, who happens to have a reputation and a population that is made up of all Massachusetts. And, and you put him near a guy have an and, against him. And you put him near a guy who remember. Let's say Gius gets off Bulger. He still served life. Okay, right. Gius's life is either going to be in GP or it's going to be in. Ad max. That's where yeah. it's going to be. That's the difference here. This is a guy who hated informants, hated women abusers, and you put the guy in general population with him and other lunatics. What do you think is going to happen? Just a, yeah. uh, listen. How Bulger's family didn't win anything, I don't know. Uh, they should. It is a suable case, but yeah, very interesting connection between Whitecho and him. I don't think it was the sole reason that if he killed him, he did it. Um, it probably added something to it. I'm going to get some vengeance for my friend, and now he'll get a, a double of vengeance because now he's getting paid as well. And if you if you do a deep dive into the Weichel case, I mean, again, it just it turns your stomach at how some of these uh, police officers, uh, FBI agents, prosecutors, and how you can sleep at night knowing that you're. I don't care what I don't I don't care that argument about I'm making a deal with the devil to get a a worse devil. That's one thing, but framing people for murders and locking people up uh, for things they had nothing to do with. And you well, I know remember, it. real quick, I remember, and this kind of is connected in a way. I remember when I did, I, I did some deep dives into that guy, Wayne Jenkins in Baltimore, mm -hmm. the gun trace task force, yeah. the guy that was like, I, I remember watching some of the, the, the interactions he would have with, with, with people in the street. And it's, it's sickening, really, to think about. It's like you can see a guy that's just solely doing stuff to jam people up to make more money. Uh, you know, it's it's really sickening. Whether it's the FBI, whether it's the police, it's, yeah. it's and, shameful. And this this case also shows 
not that we needed to have any more indication that Whitey Bulger was a depraved, yes, yeah. uh, warped, yeah. evil, I mean, pure evil individual. He writes a letter to, to Weichel's mother saying, your son didn't do this. I, I know it because I framed him. But just so you know, I ain't going to do anything to help you. I just want you to know. I'm not going to. I refuse to go uh, tell anyone this, but I just, I just think you should know that your son's in Yeah, prison. just an evil guy who, yeah. you know, likes to see people just in their worst states. Yeah. It, listen, he, I, I, guess, I also have said I think his murder is probably one of the most violent I've ever seen. I mean, his, yeah. his eyes were gouged out of his head. <laughs> but I also will say. I know Howie Carr allegedly sent uh, Gias money for doing what he did. Um, because Bulger was trying to kill what, Howie yeah. Carr. People that might not know, know Howie Carr, one of the big media personalities uh, in uh, in the Boston area, great reporter, but uh, one unfortunately, you know, had a uh, had had a murder contract put on his head, wasn't carried out. But Bulger was trying to kill Howie Carr. I think we should, uh, you know, I think a lot of people say we should throw a parade for Fred Gias. I mean, uh, yeah, I think Whitey Bulger. You probably, a fucking medal. I, yeah, I said that. Yeah, I think probably Bulger deserves, you know, he's probably the one person on earth that deserves the the, the power saw to the back of the head. You know, that that's... In, in, the, in the movie, I don't know, people, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, you know, we, we get our history from pop culture and from films and a lot of stuff that we see in a movie kind of becomes the gospel, whether or not it's true or not. And, you know, Black Mass was not a movie that was that well received. I thought it was underrated. I thought Johnny I Depp too. Was, was real. I thought I liked it. I, I yeah. thought Johnny Depp was really good as Bulger. But the the movie, in a lot of ways, sanitizes Bulger. And if you're consuming that, you're just thinking of Bulger as a hardcore gangster, which he was. But they didn't go into the fact that what Wade, Wade Bulger was a pervert. And, and was someone that liked little boys and little girls um, and, and, and wrecked havoc in, in South Boston in more ways than just racketeering and murder. I and, think when it comes to like strictly organized crime figures, Irish, Italian, I don't think there was a more, I mean, maybe Anthony Casso was very evil. Um, yeah. I, I think he was, Whitey Bulger was surely the worst probably. I, I don't, I, I don't think he, it's even comparable. Like I, I said, wish I think Casso, Casso was bad. He was a depraved guy, but yeah, it's uh, he deserved the ending he got a lock and a sock to the head and his eyes gouged out. Should have been. Kind of they kind of touched on it uh, in um, The Departed. You, yeah. you got to kind of have to pay attention to it. There's a scene early in the movie where he's talking to a young girl, clearly who's a teenager, and he's giving her money and asking if she's getting her period. And yeah, she was implying weird. that he was sleeping with her. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think they they obviously did that intentionally, even though the character was fictional, but it was loosely based. Uh, but I didn't love how they left that part out of of the the black mass narrative. You didn't need to address it. You know, you didn't need to spend 20 minutes addressing it. But you could have given us a couple minutes. I mean, on... they definitely address like that. He choked the one woman yeah, to death. That he killed like, women. That he had, they they, they didn't do much. I mean, they also, made, like, they, they, made him ase- they made him asexual in that movie. Right. He didn't right. really have a sex drive. Right, right, right. I mean, and also, like, I remember watching, I think it was 60 Minutes, where, like, they went in, they they found, like, two people that were victims of, like, his extortion and stuff. Like, he would do stuff like. A lottery person would win the lottery. He'd extort people. He and extorted he, people that won lottery tickets. Yeah, he would go lottery. to them and say, "Give me the lottery ticket, or I'm going to kill you." Like, yeah. and he won the lottery. Million like dollar lottery ticket. I'm going to buy it for twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, or if you don't agree, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, like, right. he was a it was a, a psycho. But Freddie Weichel, I mean, you know, tip tip of the cap to him. You know, he's I think he's in his early seventies. Probably he's got maybe a good 10, 15, 20 years left. Enjoy the money. I, yeah, he's got some money coming to him. Um, hey Scott, let me ask you two questions about Weichel. First of all, does Freddie Gias ever have to put money in his commissary again? And B, do you think he did kill Whitey? And do you feel um why do you do you think that was Weichel was the reason? Or do you think it was I don't think it, I agree with you. I mean, I think if 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 Whitey Bulger gets transferred into that wing and Freddie Gias had no connection to Freddie Weichel you probably have the same exact result because that's who Freddie G is was. 
Um, I believe, yes, Freddie Gias did it. And I believe if we had Freddie Gias here and there was just us, you know, talking and it wasn't going to come back to possibly bite him in court, he'd tell you that himself. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think that it was motivation. I think that from what, and this is just based on people that I've talked to that were very close to Freddie Gias, um, that say that Freddie G is considered Freddie Weichel a father figure and that the whole Whitey Bulger situation from before Freddie Gias was in prison, before Whitey Bulger was ever caught, that it was something that Freddie Gias would talk to people about and lament and say one of these days, you know, Whitey's going to get what's coming to him. So I think you can, it can both situate, both scenarios could be true. Whether or not Weichel was a factor or not, if Freddie Gias had a chance to kill Bul Bulger, he was going to kill him. But I think that it was uh, – he was smacking his lips when he heard that that Bulger was, was being transferred. I, I will say this. It would, it would be virtual hell to live in Hazleton for the rest of my life. But if there's a federal prisoner that probably lives pretty well inside, it would be him. I think I'm going to get real conspiratorial and, and yeah. say that – you could convince me, and it wouldn't take a lot of convincing, that the so, someone from the prison system or from the from the federal government knew that Gius was there, knew that those, and tipped them off and said, "Hey, we're sending we're sending this your way." Well, how else would he have known? Like, you, you just happened well, we to go there in that unit, you know? It's... We know we know from one of the co-defendants from a phone call he made to his mother. Uh, that they that the unit knew that Bulger was coming in at least you know 10 12 hours before he got there now how long besides that we, we're not sure but I like you say it, they don't make mistakes like that mm -hmm. Bulger had a lot of information on a lot of powerful people uh stuff that I think he was informing on that had still not seen the light of day I mean Scott at Scott at the time he was arrested he was literally the number one fugitive on the planet yeah. It was Bin Laden and him. And when yeah. Bin Laden got killed in, in May of, I think it was 11, I remember turning to someone and being like, Whitey Baldur's days are numbered because they've spent 10 years ignoring him. Scott, think of it like this. This would be like the feds taking El Chapo, right? And putting him in a wing with a bunch of Lozetas yeah. and just saying, oh, there you go. Like, well, what does it show? It shows you that. They weren't looking for Bulger for between 2001 and 2011. They weren't looking for Bulger. The second they decided to look for him, they found him. Which also makes you kind of wonder, like, maybe they knew the whole time where he was. Right, he was, right. Yeah. Well, this was awesome, Jeff. Thanks so much, my man. Uh, yeah. Please, everybody, go check out. If you don't know, you probably know already. But if you don't, go check out Jeff Nadeau, the Sit Down Podcast. Uh, it's, it's, it's for history buffs everywhere. He deep dives mob history like no one else, uh, you know, in this space. He's got great support and backing now from the Barstool people. Had did a great interview with with Sammy the Bull, uh, Bull Gravano a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's just it's great content. And and we love here at the OG, you know, uh, combining and, and joining forces with Jeff. Hopefully, there'll be a lot more of that uh, as we go forward. This was this, you know, we we love going around the horn, man. You know, uh, there's always. I remember at some point maybe 10 years ago, someone kind of questioning whether there was enough content to, to fill the, the tank of, of the mob tubes and the mob reporting. And I'm like, I was like, I don't think you're looking close enough or, or far enough. I'm like, it, there's always news. Well, just I think like uh... in politics, just like in sports, if, if you know where to look, there's always going to be news to talk. About. And I think if you're willing to meld other things as well in, you know, doing, you know, the cartel stuff yeah. or, you know, I've done stuff on, you know, arms dealers. I've done right. shows on, you know, all, you know, stuff that's, that's relevant in, in, in the world, you know? So yeah, uh, I appreciate talking to you. You're always uh, great. Always enjoy talking to you. And uh, I know we have to do a Jimmy Hoffa show or some sort of Frank Sheeran show soon, because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of people saying, you, you really don't believe Frank Sheeran? You know, I know you don't. So uh, yeah, yeah, we can we can definitely do a. Uh, we'll have we to do, do that at some point. Off a uh, update episode, you know, I can I can come on. We can talk about this. This it's it's so evergreen, man. It's the story that will never die. Hoffa's been dead for almost fifty years. 
The story will never die. We're going to be talking about it 50 years from now. Um, and if we, if I come on, we do a show. I'll, uh, I'll let your, I'll let your listenership or your viewership know where the, where the investigation's headed right now. I'll tease it a little bit. Um, the, from what I, from what I've heard, uh, the next place they're looking at right now is Canada. And that sounds insane. And I still, I, I still question it uh, that they uh, could have got a body uh, across the border because Detroit borders uh, Windsor, Ontario. But this, I, this theory is that a dirty Detroit police officer was a part of the hit team and that put him in the trunk of his police car, drove him across the border. They buried him somewhere, you know, in, in Windsor, Ontario, which is like a suburb of Detroit. Um, and there's a there's a very prominent uh, documentarian and researcher that has no real background in this space. His his expertise is like DB Cooper, but uh, I know that the FBI is taking this seriously, and that that's probably where it's headed. And, and when we do some content, we can deep dive that. I'll tell you this and I'll tell you again, I think he's on somebody's mantle somewhere in some sort of urn and people laugh and ever they hear the, uh, the story of where Jimmy's buried and someone laughs and yep. says he's right there. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I'm almost tired of, of uh, I, I shouldn't say all, I am tired of doing Jimmy Hoffa interviews, but Hey, if that's my, uh, that's the cross I have to bear for, for my life as a crime reporter. And I got to do Jimmy Hoffa interviews for the day I die. I guess uh, it, it'll be all right. No, I <laughs> thanks, hear you. Thanks, Jeff. Everyone go check out Jeff Nadu, uh, sit, down, sit Down Podcast, big man on campus uh, for, his, for his sports gambling. You know, I, I'm not the first one to say this. You know, if you're, if you're into college basketball, there's no, there's no better handicapper in the world. Than, than Jeff Nadu, you, uh, no, he, he breaks nice it too. down and, and analyzes it like very few can or well. Or, listen, know. Scott, I don't know if I'm the best gambler in the world, but I am the best um, breakdown of games guy in the it's world. The science, sure. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Uh, I remember you. growing up around my grandpa and his best friend Leslie. I, what do you do, Leslie? I'm a gambler. What do you mean you're a gambler? You put that on your, you put that on your tax return. Yeah, I was like, and then I go. I remember going over his house. And this is before the internet and just his just filled with research. I mean, just books and magazines and newspapers. Uh, and the, I mean, he, he showed me it, that there's a science to it. It's not just, you know, your gut or, or I saw these guys play last week. <laughs> like, you, you, you do a week's worth of research to figure out who you're betting on Sunday or Saturday. No, there's more than, it's more than just, uh, you know, Hey, uh, you know, North Carolina's playing Indiana yeah. tonight. No, there's more than that. You, you got to look into all that stuff. And yeah, I enjoy it. It's my passion. So awesome. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Jeff, great. We will uh, we will be back next week with some fresh content for Ben Augusta behind the glass on the ones and twos. He's he's really our he's our MVP. I always say it, but Ben is is pushing the needle for us. We love Ben. Jeff, thank you. Jimmy Bucciolato, who uh, couldn't join us today, he says hello. He'll be back next week, and we will see you again on the OG Podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein. Out.